First of all, I want to thank all the sponsors. It's such unbelievable support we have, Rabbi. You can see the amount of sponsors, 27, 30 sponsors, which is unbelievable support by the Hokahal. And that's really one of my visions is, is to have a grand community where everybody's one and everybody's there's peace and there's love and there's joy and everybody's, you know, it's everybody's problems are problems. Rabbi, I'm so happy to have you here. Yeah, it's a shift. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an unbelievable, you know, I, I went back to these Zoom classes just to change it up a little bit because I, I missed the interviews. I really missed the David Lieberman, I missed having you around and getting, you know, getting back into that uh, constant, but when you've been learning, I, 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 I'm a big follower of your classes, Rabbi. Um, and let's talk today. We're, I think we're going to talk a little bit about everything, a little bit about what you've been talking, a little anxiety, a little joy, a little Rav a little bit, a bit of everything. I think that the, the world needs to, to hear you more. I'm so happy you're getting out there. I heard you're uh, you're going to spend one one week of uh, one week in New York a year. I heard, I heard a news. month, a month, a month, a month. Beautiful. That's Beautiful. Awesome. Yes. It, lo it looks like you can do a lot, and that's in St. Louis. It looks like I think you're choosing St. Louis because at least you're focused. And it looks like you got a little uh, you got a little trend there. For, for, for maybe it'll come up in the conversation. Okay, is that the Obviously, the rabbi. Is a clinical psychologist. He's the of the well, social worker. School. Just the social, social worker. A little bit more than a social worker. So he, he, so the rabbi. One thing with me and the rabbi get along so much is we're, we're both dealing with addicts and we're both dealing with people in recovery, and I think we both have that same mission to bring these Hasidic teachings back to practicality, and just to see you know non-Jews be able to hear these classes and, and just it's a, it's an unbelievable thing when you see the light on people's faces and and. Their reaction towards it and it's a beautiful thing yeah it's the balsam tov is the or shiva it's the light of the seven days of creation and, and that light is shy to every single person ever and and it's shy to us wherever we're at wherever we're at and and there's certain experiences that are down at the bottom mm -hmm. And uh, to shine the light there and to find the light there as well is just a bigger chiddush. It's a, there's, there's no end to it. The, these, words are, these words of Torah are medicine, the medicine. I find myself getting a lot of directed light when I give these teachings over there. Obviously, I, I, you know, I practice in very practical psychology, but there's a lot of directed light that I get. And you know, sometimes I'd walk out of a meeting you know, just with so much energy. And so grateful to have that opportunity just to be in that space, to be able to have that opportunity to, you know, what, what a dream to be able to speak to people and, and help them and at the same time enjoy and constantly look for new, new ways to, to, you know, to present the information. It's such an unbelievable thing. It's a, just to, to clarify, it's a light for you that you feel? I feel a light when I give that the teaching. Yeah. Avada, Rabbi Nachman. Rabbeinu talks about the, the avoid of the tzaddik and the darga of Derech Eretz Shekadma Latayra. And that L'chur in the beginning, it, it seems that Derech Eretz is lower than Torah. But really, the tachlis of Torah is to come to the Torah of Derech Eretz, where a person realizes that the Torah is speaking to every single person wherever they find themselves. Up, down, fallen, built up, wherever you are. A thousand, a million times a day. So Rabbi, let's talk a little bit about how, how, how you connect to practical psychology. And I know you, I, I heard your classes and you went away from the, these, uh, you know, philosophy and you went straight into Hasidus again. Explain to, explain to the world how much, you know, it, it seems to be like everybody's, everybody's coming back to Hasidus at the end of the day. They, we went there, we've gone through the, you know, the, all, all these psychologists. At the end of the day, we're back to the basics. And what, what, how, what benefit did you get from it? And, and uh, how do you apply it now? Why did you completely move away from it? So I would, I would make a chilek, just a chilek between psychology and philosophy is two different you know, ways of thinking. Both of them ultimately are about how to live a, an easier, not easier, simpler, better, happier life. And what these people did from all different shades and colors, you know, from Freud and on, and there's a very rich light of, of Jewish thought in those places, as well as in philosophy, especially modern philosophy. But, but ultimately, there's absolutely nothing that is not found in, in our tzaddikim. That's Aleph. It's found in our tzaddikim in a more pronounced way, and it gives you a way of living with it. What those books offer is language. They offer 
the vessel of expression and specific language to convey the idea in an ever so slightly more precise way so that it speaks to the heart of the human being just a little bit more. Beautiful. Yeah, that's what I would say. Rabbi, do you spend more time meditating or doing his body do? What do you what, what is your aye, practical aye, aye. what's your practical schedule? Aye, 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 aye. I want to hear your practical schedule. My practical schedule is determined by a teaching from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov at the end of Lukuta Maharan in the first volume, mm-hmm. where Rabbi Nachman quotes the, the basic interpretation of the Gemara, the mitzvah of koveya itim la Torah, of setting aside time for Torah, for engagement in avodas Hashem and in connecting to Hashem and elevating the world to Hashem. And what Rabbi Nachman says is the opposite of what the typical translation is. Typically, people think it means setting time, but there's another way. Rabbi Nachman says koveya also means to steal, to steal time that doesn't exist. And, and that's, that's my daily schedule. It's uh, any moment that offers itself to, to be learned, to engage with Hashem, to try and talk or think. It's all, it's all zehu zeh. Halavai, we should be able to do the, the actions also. But, um, but hispodidus, uh, hispodidus, davening, washing the tilasidayim, cleaning your hands for the day, preparing the day, saying modaani. You know. Simple, simple. And, and then learning Torah at any second and thinking about Sadiqim. Rabbi, I heard you do it. Yeah, I just heard a recent class you did. And this is something I've been very much into. Obviously, 2020, 2021, the lack of breath, the lack of breath that we've had seems to be like we're <sighs> so, somehow suffocating. And uh, this yeah. concept of this, you know, there's always a, there's a ruach that we want to blow and there's a ruach that's, that's opposing us at constant time. Rabbi Nachman talks about this. You give a beautiful kavan, a beautiful intention, and when you blow in, you're connecting to the name of Elohim or the name of Ad, uh, Adnut. Ad, Ad, Adnut. Yeah. Right. I heard another chedush from another, another that it, it, basically it's the same concept. Though. The vaday. And, the vaday. Yeah, and exhale is exhaling with your kevavke. Mm-hmm. So just explain that a little bit. How what a person can practically, you know practically do it, just even breathing, just to take five minutes to breathe and connect sure. to those two names. Let's talk about, bring, up, bring that in a practical sense, sure. what that sure. means. Sure, so I'll, I'll do my best because what I saw this teaching brought down in the works of the Tzaddik, uh, the Rebbe, Rav Yitzhak Meyer Morgan Stern Shlita, in his weekly printouts. And it was a, a teaching brought out from the Zidich of Rebbe, who was the, the uncle of the Kamar Rebbe. So just a history of these Tzaddikim. The notion of, of having the intention of a name in mind, the name of Hashem, a name of Hashem is, is a way that Hashem reveals himself to us in our individual lives, which we very often feel as moods that we experience in our lives, up, down, high, low. And each name represents a, a different iteration from amongst the infinite possibilities of Hashem's revelation in our lives of how we can connect Hashem at that moment. Now, these particular names are Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, which is the way that the name of Hashem is pronounced. That represents Malchus. That represents a, a lower way of experiencing life, difficulty, concealment. And the Shem Havaya, the four-letter name of Hashem, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yud Kei Vav Kei, represents clarity and, and the ability to move forward. And, and the revelation of Hashem in one's life, in one's family, in one's interpersonal life, individually. And so one would assume that the process of inhaling, which is the excitement and the preparation for a new breath, the previous moment has ended and now I'm starting again, and inhaling is about possibility and movement. One would think that that's associated with the clarity of Hashem, with the four-letter name of Hashem, yud kei vav and that the lower name of Hashem, the name of concealment, Adlathad Nun Yud, would be associated with exhaling. But what the tzaddikim point out is that when you inhale in truth, that's not the highest level. The highest level, even though we would think the highest level is the inhale to, to move inwards and closer to Hashem, and we would think to find the name Havaya there, instead we find the name Adnus there, which means the lower level of experience. So what we typically assume to be higher, which is closeness to Hashem, 
turns out to be of a lower level, which means that exhaling, which is usually the process of being human, of being okay, of taking a break, of, of struggling and, and really, you know, being in the world, that's in truth the highest level. That's, that's the name of Hashem in its essence. So when you inhale, you realize that it, it's not about running forward all the time. It's not about moving forward all the time and becoming more and doing more. It's really about being okay with where you're at in that given moment. And you need both, obviously, at every single moment. This also ties back to obviously the Aleph, the, the, the whole Indian of Elul and the another beautiful class you did on the concept of defeating a Malik, the lower Aleph, the upper Aleph, building the Beit HaMikdash. Another, it's all one. It's all, it's all it's, you know, these tough days and these good days, it's all one. That's, that's the really, you know, I think we're so, we're so, I myself, I, I'm tremendously moody. And I, you know, I feel everything. And I think that's one thing that helps me help people, but it's one thing that the battle, constant battle of, you know, the mood to go to pray and the mood to go learn and the mood to go help people. It's just, it's a, you know what, it's you know what they say in the room, you know yeah. what they say in the rooms, it's halt. You know, before, before we lose our minds over this, we have to first check if we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Most of the time, that's why. Right, right. exactly. But just this overwhelmness that we have. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that have really helped me the most from Rav Nachman is, is, is really focusing on the mood afterwards. Even he, he, Rav Nachman even comes to a point and tells us, listen, you have to fake it till you make it. And, you know, where do you hear that from? Where do you hear this? You, you don't hear this. It's such a beautiful language because you think, okay, I'm in a bad mood. I'm, I'm hostage to my situation. Rav Nachman's saying the opposite. You, you have to make it. You have to fake it. Then I'll come. Just, it's, it's unbelievable. You, know, you hear these kinds of teachings. You're like, wow. It transforms from? everything. Yesh and yan shiyitapechakol. As Rabbi Nassim said, there is something that transforms everything. Everything we thought we knew about presence huh. versus absence and what is right for us as individuals. The, the job is not to go out and scream in the streets. The job is to share and, and light a candle for whoever wants to come in. But... It's the possibility of finding Hashem specifically where you didn't expect to find Hashem, because Hashem right. is everywhere. Amazing, amazing. You know, I was I was learning a little bit about Makute uh, Chalachas on um, on our beats in the mid the and it says something beautiful how God originally created the world with the concept of din, because and in order, Rav Nasta says that in order, so we should always go into surrender right away. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. And, and 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 because ultimately we, we surrender automatically right hmm. away we would, we would get into this this regime that we would get into such a higher level but you can see today that's the, that's the hardest thing is that bitter process is the the constant control the anxiety the hmm. the, the hmm. lack of bitter mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and I, when i read that i said wow it would have been more beneficial if god created the world that have been but we couldn't handle it that means the, the reward just explain the process of surrendering, why it's so beneficial. I speak about it all in my classes constantly, the yeah. rooms constantly. But what is, what, what is surrender really getting us? Oy. So the, there's this, this sugya, it's tempting to me because this sugya is a sugya that speaks to the very core of what I think the Rashbi was showing and the Zohar Kadosh was showing and the Arizal and the Baal Shem Tov and the Gra and the Ramchal and the Rashash and, and all of the tzaddikim. But on the other hand, it has to be a, a practical level. So right. I think we'll focus on the practical level right now. Sure. The, the notion of din, of, of judgment, of constriction, of concealment, represents the idea that there's something that's not present to me. It's something I don't have. I'm desiring something. I'm, there's a limitation on me. The experience of chesed is what I actually have, what I can hold on to, what I could grab onto in this world. If we really boil down to it, what we find is that most of our desires and most of our sources of anxiety are about what we don't have, you know, a certain sense of scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough for some future situation. Going back to the place of din is going back to a place where it's okay to... to to not have enough, to be enough. It's okay to feel that Hashem is, is present in that very specific moment. The sense of grasping something, of, of gaining something, of holding it, 
You know what? I, I, I want to I want to retract my thought, Reb Gedalia, just to be for the sake of the purposes to share a, a true thought. So the fact that Hakadosh Baruch Hu created the world in Din means that the highest way of connecting to Hakadosh Baruch Hu is by being okay with what we don't have. Right. Is by being okay with what we don't have, and there's a real avoid of dancing with what we have. But the but the ikar avoida is to acknowledge that Hashem, even what I don't have is from you. Because all of the lacks and all of the desires we feel, if we think that we're in control of fulfilling them completely, then we'll always be meshuga and we'll always be so sick and, and shikr and, and hungry and craving. But if I realize that it's okay for me to settle into to what I don't have, all of the fears and the tefillos and all of the things that are missing in my life, ultimately that's just because Hashem, you're so big that I can't understand anything. Din means I can't understand it. Din means there's a limitation here. I, I don't fully grasp the idea. That means tachlis hayadiyah shaloneda, right? Rabbi Nachman points out all the time that the purpose is to not know. Not knowing is an aspect of din. It means that there's a limitation. I'm, I'm constricted. And in that place, the avodah is surrender. In that place, when I realize that Hashem, what I don't have is not because of me, it's because you're just so big that I can never understand. Right. If I could understand, then, then what difference would there be between me and Hashem? It's in the din itself, in the not understanding, that I can allow myself to surrender to you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and say, you know, Gam lo mimcha. which Rabbi Nachman says is the aspect of din, of withholding. Even that's part of you, Hashem. And we have to realize that ultimately the main experience of Hashem is in giving over ourselves, being mavatal ourselves to the fact that we ultimately have no control over anything whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing other than the, the Bechira to have Amuna in that moment, which transforms everything. And this is why really the real simple today is to be resilient. I think that's the real simple today, just to be able to constantly get up and yeah. why did I fall, how did I fall? Yeah. To, to have really this, you know, this okay. mindset of, of definitely being recognized and we don't know nothing. We don't know nothing. That's really, we don't know. It's, and, it's, and the only thing we could do is move forward. Right. What other option is there? And, and, and this is something I see in the rooms all the time. I see in my facility. It's, and the, and the problem is most of the meaning that people are giving is based on a past experience that is affecting the future. So you can see how much of a sabotage. This is why we're forced to get people in recovery to, to surrender because they're getting in their own way. And you know, it, it's such a, and you see when the, and it's something you see when the person finally says, you know what, I don't know anything, surrender. You see the face change. You see the energy. You see, almost see, see the, I, mean, I see it like a light in the person's face. It's, it's something very magical. It's admitting. It's 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 entering in. You know what does the word admit mean? Right. Let's just use the context of the twelve steps for a second here to make this point closer. And this comes back to what you said earlier. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. Now I sent this message out to my Facebook during the beginning of COVID, and I wrote, "We admitted we were powerless over everything and that our lives have become unmanageable." And it got a ton of likes and it was a chachma that that so many people were feeling right. you know just a powerlessness over anything and then when they hear where it's from i mean people know already that there's yesh chachma in in the broken places you know it's a it's a very powerful chachma right. and by by giving in by recognizing that i'm powerless that's what gives me the ability to receive that which comes from above me. That's not coming from me. But what does the word admit mean? Right? So we admitted we were powerless. Admitting sometimes sounds like I know that I'm powerless. And now I just have to tell the truth about it. Almost like I'm hiding a truth that I know. And now I'll admit it to you. So people think that to be powerless, a person has to know that they're really powerless. And then they just share that with the rest of the world, which blocks so many people because no one truly feels powerless. But another way of looking at the word admit is like buying a ticket of admission, like buying a ticket to enter into a concert, to enter onto an airplane, to enter into a space. I've admitted myself into that room, which means entering in willfully, 
choosing to act as if, like we said before, of, of faking it until you make it. Am I powerless? Am I not powerless in my life? Let me, let me assume I'm powerless. And then something happens that every moment is just a little bit more okay. Because you, you believe in a power greater than yourself naturally when you become powerless. It's a mammalian. Yeah, it's amazing how Rav Nachman is asking Rav Nachman, telling him all his troubles. And Rav Nachman says, what's the problem? Just make yourself into nothing. And he's asking, how, how do I do that? Just close your eyes, close your mouth, and pretend nothing, you're nothing. And, and that's really the ultimate transformation that I've seen in my life is this, is this, is constantly surrendering, surrendering, surrendering. And, it, and it's, done, it's done miracles for me. Because I know that when I'm in a weak state, when a person's in, this, in a negative state, is in a mochum kadnum, this is where it's more prone to get angry and to, and to, so you actually have to go the other way. And this is what I, I you know, lesson 65 really changed my life. I'm going to be honest with you. Lesson 65 about Bittal, it, it changed my whole life completely. You want to hear something interesting? Rav Meyer Morgenstern this week wrote that he heard in the name of a tzaddik, and he was quoting it, that Torah 65 is, is like the, the, the middle point, the, the, the Evan Hashasiya, the foundation stone of all of Lukutim Maharan. Because if we just come to, you know, reading the the, the Lukutim Tevilas on that, that the whole light, the impression, I mean, practically, the impression that a person gets is based on the struggle that he has going through Bittal. So the, the, to the extent that in a practical sense, let's say I'm going through divorce or a person is going through practice, to the extent that you don't spend that time running away and, and kind of continuing to stay in balance and, and fight, the, fight the fatigue and fight the darkness, that's the vessel that you're creating for the new light that's going to come to you once you become, once you enter that situation. I mean, this is something that's not taught to people, that after pain, there's a gift. There's a gift. There's a new mindset. There's a major gift. It's a beautiful thing. And it transforms every experience in this world from being difficult to being the very site where we're meant to serve God and we're right. meant to engage. Every moment of life, which is difficult, like R Rabbi Nachman points out, he says, people talk about this world. He's like, I, I guess that's somewhere, perhaps. I believe in a world to come. What I don't believe in is this world, because this world is hell. Everyone's struggling. So if this life is struggle, that means this life provides every single moment is a renewed opportunity to encounter HaKadosh Baruch Hu on the level of the Kohen Gadol entering into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. We are in the Tachlis, the Tachlis Hayerida, in the lowest point imaginable, that's where we get to serve Hashem every single moment. Amazing, amazing. An amazing it's thing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, a person can go and, and, and really, really, and even, even praying itself, we're, we're so involved with the results, we're so involved, you know, my feeling and my, even that experience itself, just praying and letting go, just going with the energy that's, that, that Hashem's given you, it makes such a difference than when a person praying, I'm not feeling it, I'm feeling it, I'm tired, I, I don't, or it's all that, this constant control. We're so, I, I've never seen so much obsession with control. Just let go. It's so, it's mm -hmm. so simple, but so difficult. It, you're absolutely right. I'm interested to hear a little bit more of Gedalia on, on what letting go means. Because for me, I could speak from my experience that yes, you know, when, when, when the tefillah is difficult and you're sitting there in your talis and tefillin and, and the words just don't, they're, they're another language. The words that yesterday made you feel like you were the closest you've ever been to Hashem today mean absolutely nothing. And so a person can let go and allow a light to descend onto them, which is avada true, it's certainly true, but the image that emerges from that is almost new age uh, as a language I would use. I think that and I know that's not what you're saying. I think the ikker right. is that the mice itself, whatever you're doing and however you're doing it, is exactly what you need to be doing at that moment. Right. I mean, it, we could also speak about lesson 25, the constant, you know, the new, the new klipas, the new madaman that reaches a person every single level. Mm -hmm. So he could be on, the, on, the, on a good path. And all of a sudden, he's getting attacked from nowhere. Where is this coming from? And, and that's really it. So if you don't, we don't have these tools, I mean, you have a bad day, you get knocked out. But these tools at least give us the, the ratzon to say, okay, there's a new level that I'm reaching. And this is why the constant state of just the gratitude, the gratitude breaks all mm -hmm. obstacles. Mm -hmm. This is something that through joy you will exit. 
We always have that, that line in our minds. Through joy, we will exit. Then we can always go to joy. It doesn't have to be logical. It's just a place we go to. Right. And, and the descriptions that were offered about what joy actually is, is an incredible thing. Because for, for me, on a certain level, what joy means in, in Rabbi Nachman, as I humbly understand it, it, is the possibility of living in a state of wholeness mm, in what you know is brokenness. To I, dance, I, but I, mamish at dusk, like a, to dance at, at dusk. I started, I used to eat milk chocolate, but now all my chocolate's been bittersweet. You know, 40%, 50% uh, bitter. Mm -hmm. Just because there's no, there's nothing is nothing is permanent. It's all, you know, it's it has to have the bitterness. And, and that's where the taste that, comes from. That's where the ikar chiddush comes from. That's where the dance comes from. That's where the joke comes from. Rabbi Nachman is hilarious. The yes. Baal Shem is hilarious also, but they, they give us the punchline to the joke, and then we're still supposed to live as if we don't know the punchline to the joke. To be freilich sign, to dance wherever you are. Mile de Stusa, yes, it means dancing on a tie dyed bus if that's your thing, on whatever level that means right. something. But but for, for a person, Mile de Stusa can be a choice to think positively for another minute. Rabbi, I really loved your teaching about not caring. Mm. And this is something that I've spoken a lot about that, you know, every path, everybody has his own path. And obviously, the more we're worried about other what people say, the less likely we're going to get to that path. And this is one of the paths that, thank God, meeting with Rav and telling you know, I'm going to do my thing, and I can't care what people say. And people like it, they don't like it. But this, and Rav Nachman advice is that this is the only way you, you can actually succeed. Mm -hmm. That the concept of not caring, not caring, not thinking everything so personal. Mm -hmm. You know, all day long we're so worried about, oh, this Rabban said this, this guy didn't like. You have to get to the point of not caring. And it's, it is such a high light because you're free. Talk a little bit about that. I was thinking, Rab Gedalia, you know, Sikho Saran starts off, right? Starts off with the teaching of commenting on the Pasuk in Tehillim where David HaMelech says, because today I know, now I know how great Hashem is. Ki ati adati, now I know. And what Rabbi Nachman wants to understand is why is David HaMelech saying, I know? Is he speaking about a truth for himself or is he speaking about a universal truth? I specifically, says Rabbi Nachman. Why is David HaMelech highlighting the sense of self and the interpretation of that Pasuk for him? And what Rabbi Nachman quotes is a, is a statement from the Zohar based on the Pasuk and Mishle that, that we sing on Friday night of Eishat Tchayil, of, of about the woman of valor. The song that we sing is Noida Basharim Bala, that her husband will be known in the gates of town through her. Meaning his, her reputation is what gives him, you know, a, a sense of self. And the Zohar Kadosh says Noida Basharim Bala, her husband will be known in the gates. What it really means is each and every person according to the measure, the conjecture, the imagination of their own heart. And, and that's a vada, the most important teaching because each and every person has their own relationship with the Torah and with the Tzaddik and with friends and with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and each person is their own world. But Rabbi Nachman is starting us off with that. Your truth is your truth, no matter what. The, the, the most basic and essential condition is that your truth cannot be a harm to you or a harm to another person. That's what it means to be a human being. But beyond that, your truth is your truth. And if you're connected to the truth, if you're connected, then you don't have to worry about what anyone else is thinking. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Meaning even, what the, even if what they're saying is true, it doesn't matter. The truth is, though, that most of the time no one's saying anything. Right, right. It, it's amazing on that same, I, I believe in that same Torah that he's also talking about how God is known by the own gates of our own heart. Right, that's the teaching. Right. And that's true. Each and every one of us have our own true perspective and it could be different than the other person, but it's right. equally true because from the perspective of the center of the circle, every point around the circle is equidistant. Right. That's why Rabbi Nachman says we dance in circles for joy because joy is the recognition that Wherever I am, I have enough. Shakai, Hashem is here with me right now, and there's enough. I don't have to be jealous. And I was thinking, you know, the 
the, the statement of the Mishnah is that kina, taifa, and kavo take a person out of the world, that jealousy, temptation, and the desire for honor take a person out of the world. But we also know that each person is their own world. So in truth, the world that it's taking me out of is my own. When I start looking at other people's worlds, I'm, I'm being removed from my world. And then Mamela, I'm jealous and I'm comparing. But in truth, I, my, I'm, I'm a universe. It's a, it's a, it's a, I, I often say stay in your lane. That's my uh, the simple exactly. way of saying it. Exactly. exactly. But it's also, it's Torah Hay, right? It's, Correct. it's the 50th. The whole world is created for me. And so what do I have to say? What's the next thing? It, it's so, it's a novelty. If the world was created for me, that means I have to see what I have to fix. Beautiful. It's amazing. The, the assumption is that something's broken. Beautiful. And our only job is to try and fix a little bit, our little part. Right. It, it appears to be that we have the opposite strategy. What can the world do for me? I think that's where the, all the pain comes. What can the world do for me? What can everybody do for me? This is where, the, where you see people in real pain because they're always mm -hmm. in the expectation. They get nothing. Resentment. Else. Resentment. Exactly. Exactly. Rabbi, talk a little bit about it. I know you've done, I think, 10 classes on anxiety. And I think one of my favorite topics, obviously, um, anxiety and time is definitely less than 61 in the second half. Um, a person's with God's above time and space. I think this teaching that God's above time and space. I, I think say more. That, say more about the teaching. I, right. I don't know the, 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 when a person, the, the teaching basically says that according to the level, the level of consciousness, is how time contracts for you. That means time is only an absence of consciousness. So if you're conscious, there's, time doesn't bother you. When and, you're dreaming. And, and, and it's such, I think it's one of my favorite, I, I, every one of these stories is just- Because we're, we're awesome. really dreaming, we're dreaming. Yeah, I mean, because the, the more conscious I am, for example, I'm enjoying this conversation, I'm not looking at my time. But if I'm not enjoying this conversation, I'm telling my guy, okay, 15, 40 minutes, let's go. You understand when we're, and, and this is such a beautiful Torah for me, obviously, because you know, even when I'm dabbling or when I'm learning, when I'm not focused, when, I'm, when, when it's becoming a burden for me, so I'm doing something, but I know it's, and I know my kavan is not there. My head's not in that situation. Because if my head was in the situation, I would completely feel everything. Right. My heart's divided. But the, the connection between anxiety and, and lack of consciousness, uh -huh. it's so, it's, I think it's, uh -huh. it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I so badly want to take the detour and discuss Torah Salmah Aleph with you, but I'll keep, on, it, I'll keep in my way. We'll come back to it because ultimately the biggest answer to anxiety is what Rabbi Nachman says in that Torah. Because anxiety, Consciousness. Uh, conscious time consciousness. Time consciousness. Consciousness of time. Time and consciousness are deeply connected. There's no humanity. There's no being human without already being thrown into time. I always imagine the, the, the little rabbit in, in Alice in Wonderland, the half deal, where he's running around with his big watch and it says, I'm late, late for a very important date. That's the sense of anxiety. Being human is being mizuman. It's being called to something. I'll, I'll, and the coolest thing, Rabbi Gidai, is that, you know, on some of these uh, Yemei Maharanat, these books of Rabbi Nassan and his life history, they, they have this beautiful picture of his, of his pocket watch that they found. And it was polished off. But the most amazing thing is that there's no hands on the clock. Wow. They had fallen off over time. So the only image of the pocket clock that we have is a pocket clock without hands. And it's mamish like, that's the, that's the metzias of what Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nassim were giving us. He was always clock. running. He was always moving. Nobody oh my gosh, over. on an impossible level. It's yeah. not possible. What he does, even in Alim La Trufa, is impossible. It's, it's, it's <laughs> He's unbelievable. Writing, I have no time, I have no time, I have no time, but I'm still <laughs> writing the most beautiful letters to you. It, it, it's unbelievable. But, but the, practicality of, the, attack, the practicality of today, of fear of missing out, or did I marry the right person? Exactly. Did I get, can I get a better job? This constant mm -hmm, mm -hmm. heavy weight of, I'm never Being in the right the wrong place. place. At the wrong time. It's a result of being kicked out of Gan Eden. But Beautiful. the antidote is, is, is sitting, is, is resting, is being okay where you're at and realizing that, first off, don't be such a, an arrogant person to think that your decisions in this world can impact the ultimate truth of what your reality is supposed to be. Right. Don't, don't think, don't be so afraid that you're going to break something. You know, take yourself seriously enough to value what you do and invest it with kavana. But beyond that, it's like the, the simpleton, rock belilates on us, you know. Only thing I don't care for here is, is ridicule or belittling. 
Beyond that, everyone do your own thing. Right, but this is the, definitely this is definitely one of the biggest problems today. Where you know, and I speak again, I speak to many. Just getting that that I married the right one. Okay, you married the one, make the best of it. Did I get the right job? Okay, if you did or not, make the best of it. The concept of making it making it greener, where you want to where you water it concept. Not like you know what I could have could have been greener over there. This concept of fear of missing out, this FOMO, is mm -hmm. driving the world crazy. But that's that's the birthplace of anxiety. It's what happened yeah. with Cain and Hevel. Cain's punishment for killing Hevel, which was again, Cain means to acquire something. I want power in this world. Hevel means wow. meaninglessness and breath. I, I want to run away from this world. Cain kills Hevel. The body Beautiful. kills the soul. That's the birthplace of the self. So what's Cain's punishment? What is the nature of being human in this world as a body that covers over the soul, that covers over Hevel? It's no v'nad You're going to wander to and fro. This is from the Kajnitzer Magid. It's Mefurish and it's, I believe one of the fundamental teachings. Cain says, I'm going to run. And, and he asks, why couldn't he just stop? Why couldn't he just sit? What kind of punishment is this? And the Kajnitzer Magad said that Hashem spread a partition in his brain that prevented him from finding comfort in that moment. That anxiety is the sense that there's not enough time, something is going to come and take it away. And therefore, th what I'm doing now is, is meaningless. I can't rest where I'm at. And so Kayan says, uh, human, humanity says, anxiety says, Hashem, Gadol Avaini Min so I can't carry this. Like, are you kidding me? This is how I'm going to be meant to, to be a human being, to feel like every second I'm running and not able to be comfortable. And so Hashem says to Kayan, I'm going to give you a sign that people are not going to kill you. Relax. And so there are a couple of statements in Chazal. One statement in Chazal says he gave him a dog, which is a <laughs> really powerful teaching. But, but the Gemara says that he gave him Shabbos. He gave him oh. Shabbos. And what the Kajan Tzermagad says is that, yes, you'll be anxious and running and returning, but the antidote is Shabbos and the aspect of Shabbos, living a life of Shabbos, living a life of, and what do we say on Shabbos? Ki ilu kom as if all of your work is done. There's nowhere to rush. Nothing to do. Right. To rush to. There's nowhere to rush. And it's ki ilu, it's pretending. Because no one can actually say they have what they need. We have to pretend we have what we need. And then mamela, we have what we need. Like the simpleton, if we truly, I heard this from the, the closest student of, of Ravichemeyer, when the Tom, when the simpleton was eating his bread and saying, this is delicious meat, he was tasting meat. He was tasting meat. Mom. Beautiful. That's a beautiful Hidush on Kain and Evel. Kain oh. concept of always needing acquisition and Evel's like, that's it, running away from this world. For capitalism, that's, that's, it's just, if there's a problem internally, there's a solution ex outside of me. Beautiful. What a beautiful Hidush. Beautiful, beautiful concept. I, I really love that. Such I never saw it that way. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. One of my it's favorite beautiful. teachings. So the Magad of Kajnitz, the whole Sefer is filled with. There's so many lessons in Parsha's Bereshit. It's so, I mean, it seems to be like, you know, I've been, I've been on, I've been, I've been teaching a lot about uh, order and disorder, lesson 82 in the second half, about okay. Kofma, you know, bringing the 26 back in the picture, the 45 minus the 19, bringing the 26. The, the, uh, root, the, the root causes... The yeah, the root cause is the twenty is, is a person controlling. I want to rule an There's Ani so many lessons in, in partial inspiration that we could just, I mean, we could live with. It's unbelievable. I, I think that the same point can be brought out by the story. It's it's from they say it in the name of the Rijiner and they say it in the name of the Vilnagon. That they would say that the entirety of the Torah and wisdom is contained within the first word of Bereshis. And then they would say not only the first word of Bereshis first, but the first letter of Bereshis. And then the Gross said, not only the first letter of Voracious, but the tiny black point in the center of the base, everything is contained in that. And that's exactly what we were just saying, that everything you could possibly need is in each and every moment. Ah, you fall, you fall the next moment. That just means you're entering a higher level. Everything is always moving upwards. Well, Nachman says, if you know the Kuta Maran, you're not going to need any other safe. Avad. Because Lakuta Maran teaches you how to learn other svarim, or halavai to be satisfied with Lakuta Maran alone. That's or a, just to be able to see everything in the world through that book, which mm -hmm. has been such a you know, no, really for twenty something it. years, it's been such a gift, such a gift. Halavai, such a halavai, ashrecha, ashrecha v'tovlach. This is the this is bit to walk with the Torahs. To the tzaddik is in the book. The a, a person thinks they're just reading a dead book. No, when you read Lakuta Maran, when you read any sefer, but really Lakuta Maran and the Zohar. 
you're 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 with you're with the 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 shechina. You're you're there with the tzaddik. The tzaddik is speaking to you, you know, from from the book. Just an eitzah that I received once that for for someone who can't go to Uman and be you know to to read to learn the books to study the books is is it's connecting to it. Yeah, avadai. Rabbi, give us give us give the viewers some advice. Uh, I'm having a Rosh Hashanah class in Miami Beach tomorrow. But give 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 them give them your tips some tips on Rosh Hashanah that you that you practically do some advice for people to have a Rosh Hashanah good year or connect to. Mm-hmm. What would you recommend? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so the first is the first is to 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 set your intention in the morning to to remember in the morning and before you go to bed that that this is a big day. It's a like every day is a big day, but it's a big day. It's a day that I want to be present for, and so I need to be willing to exert the mental energy necessary to try and enter into a state that I would like to live in, an ideal state, a state of connection to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, a state of not getting angry, a state of being calm, and, and it demands mindfulness. So a person wants to, to almost offer that korban up in the morning and say, Akadosh Baruch Hu, ani. I, I'm ready, I accept upon myself the willingness to try and pay attention today. And then to, to choose whichever part of tefillah that you find yourself in, to pay attention to the words, to, to really, not only to read the words, but to allow the words to, to try and find yourself in the words. That's the last teaching in the Kutamaran is to find yourself in Tehillim. That means to try and make the tefillah more personal to you. Find it in your life. Don't just see David HaMelech running away from his enemies. Look at yourself running away from the fears and the threats and all of the different things. And, and then to, to daven what you want. And then in Shmon Esrei, if a person's daven Shmon Esrei, Talk to Hashem, you know, at the end, be to, to talk to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to, to realize that he's the king and that Hashem runs the entire world and that we're renewing the, the energy of this year. And, and, and then when the shofar blows, when the shofar blows, to close your eyes and to attempt just for a moment to, to be as empty as the shofar, to simply be carried away with the, the, the almost meaningless sound or, or the call, it's not a sound even, it's just a, it, it's air moving through a, a, an empty vessel, it's air moving through something, and the vessel allows that air to, to be heard even more, and to recognize that, yes, there's din and there's difficulty in this world, but like the air that moves through the shofar from the reddened face of the person who's blowing that shofar, and to try and look at the person blowing the shofar as well, looking at the cheeks, and, and the holding of the breath and the willingness to be present for that sound and to give yourself over to Hashem, to be Moser Nefesh, to forget about everything that you're worried about, but carrying the things that you need to carry with you. It means forgetting about your family or means connecting with all of yourself. And then when eating, to, to be mindful of your eating, to try and chew your food, to swallow it before you put another bite in your mouth and, to, and then to enjoy time with family and eating good things and, and being present and, and not to be crazy, to, to be present and, and realize that Hashem, as much as you can, realize that Hashem is the king over everything. And when you have a struggle doing that, think about how chaotic everything is in the world. Think about how scary everything is and out of control everything is. And then you're going to need the comfort of, of believing yeah. that Hashem is the king of the world. And you accept it upon yourself. Beautiful, beautiful so. advice. Rav says a beautiful thing on the shofar. It's, like, it's really the cleaning the creating shofars when we can make our own thunder. When we speak mm. loud, it's the, the same effect as, as, as thunder, which is really- Torah hey also, the fifth teacher. Torah hey, Torah hey, breaking the, breaking the liboom, breaking the, the fears that created these clouds that we uh, titled the past year. Right, and, and to what, what, what that means to, to, to believe in the meaning of your avoda. To I hear the words you're saying. To hear what you're saying and to realize, oh my goodness, I'm a Jewish person davening to the master of the world. That's it. There's nothing more, nothing less than that. I have the opportunity to serve the master of the universe and to have a conversation and to, and also to realize that I can't survive for a second without that. Correct. It's, it's either way, you know, either way. Rabbi Nassim used to like to say that, they used to say that there's no moment, ein rega beli pegia, ein, ein rega beli pegima. There's no moment no without torment. Without torment or blemish, but Rabbi Nachman would also say, "But yes, but ain ain rega beli pegia. There's no moment without the ability to pray and to find oneself. 
in that moment. You, you did a beautiful analogy the other on how our sages dealt with anxiety, and Ramnathan definitely he, he elevated his anxiety in prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he talked about mm -hmm. his anxiety, and this is something we see all the time in the rooms. People just talk it out. The fact that talk it out, just talking it out, is such a difference. Nafshi yatsa bediburi. Talking it out. Nafshi yatsa bediburi. And 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 also to talk to friends, to find chaderim, yedidim, teachers, people. Just talk you out your worries instead of holding them in. This is definitely your output. Sure. Your being vulnerable. Just talk it out. This is really what we want. Really, mm -hmm. to, you know, create that community. Um, go ahead, Rabbi. No, that's it. That's it. I agree. I think we're going to take some questions from the crowd. Ariel, you there? Rabbi yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Rabbi, where can people see your classes? My classes. So I have a, a YouTube channel titled Joey Rosenfeld, and I have a set up playlist of all of the different series of classes. There's also a podcast called Inward um, from Chef a Podcast, with, which has all of the classes. Beautiful. I see you're doing a lot of interviews now. I see that. You're following the uh, shoot advice. You got to get out there, Rabbi. Now, I'm, oh, you've always, I you know, I, I take your advice very seriously, Rabbi. So the teachers, your teachings are wonderful. We should only merit to penetrate it in our hearts. Just Hashem. Ariel, let's, let's take some questions. Okay, sure. So how does how does one deal with temper? I mean, go ahead. Okay. Um, you have to dive in first because it's not a, it's a, a, coming from a person who has, you know, who understands very well what, what temper is. Um, you have to dive in first. And, 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 and if you try and control your anger when you're already angry, you've already lost the fight. That's an impossibility. You know, our sages tell us that, that uh, being angry is like serving a, a foreign idol. Because in both of those situations, you know, you 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 have you get you think you have more control than you actually have, and so it, to be not angry while I'm angry is an impossibility. So prepare oneself when to understand the triggers that that cause my temper to flare up, to understand the things that get to me, and to try and 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 create tools where I can try and avoid those or prevent them. And to be prepared for those situations. And if I know that it's coming, I'll have more of the ability to take a deep breath with the count to five in my head prior to getting upset and to try and hold on to the mindfulness that, that I'm, I'm deliberately right now trying to overcome my anger. And, and there's no greater work for the soul. There's no greater divine service than that. But I would say it's about preparation and about identifying and dealing with triggers. Also, not, not not holding things in. I mean, that's you know, it's you know, yeah. When you see people in my facility, they get angry over absolutely every little thing. It's because it's coming from the years and years of being things that they've been held in, and all of a sudden they get triggered and boom. Mm -hmm. So this is the you need to do a lot of meditating, a lot of a lot of praying, a lot of vidui, just to get these things off your chest. Because when you're holding things in, you know, you walk into a, a room, you you have, you know, it's like tell me how do you fix my shalom bite. Every time I, you know, I move the, uh, the the table the wrong way, I'm getting yelled at. Now, obviously, it's not to do with the table; it has to do with the resentment. So, first, you have to clear all this resentment. Resentment towards your creator, resentment towards everything. So, I I, I recommend a lot of letting go. You know, making That's sure you're getting it. Huh? This morning, this is what I do. Okay. Ritual, letting go. I, I I'll be honest with you. The days that I don't do his body do it, I'm I'm a different person. It's not I'm not I. You can't. You will not recognize who I am. I mean, you you can call the Amber Alert. Where is this? What happened to Kedahaya? The days I don't do it, it's, it's, the days I don't go to the mikvah and do what he's supposed to do, I can tell you, I, you won't recognize me. It, it's the energy and the amount of people, and it's just, it can take over you, this energy. So you have to do a lot of preventative things, you know, working out, the exercise, just getting getting that edge off of, of life. Because otherwise, it's going to be almost impossible to get, to get rid of temper. Things are not going to go your way, I guarantee you. So you have to either get to a higher consciousness state where every, every little thing doesn't bother you, but things are going to bother you. I mean, there's that Always. Guarantee. It's the wisdom of Alexander and the No Good, Very Bad, Horrible Day. You ever read this book? No. Uh, no. It's die. And so you'll read it. Things are going to bother you. Things are going to bother you. We're not, we're not safe from this. It's a, it's a kid's book, but that when you accept the fact that 
days are days and that things are going to go the way they go, then you open up onto the real possibility of choosing to see it good, choosing to uncover the good. I was set up for a Moroccan joke for rabbis. I said I can't do Moroccan jokes and I will. But I was set up for a Moroccan joke. <laughs> Next question. Sure. So this is a two-part question. What does it mean to create a vessel? And what does it mean to go into Bittle, Bittle and surrender? <laughs> these, are, these are questions. Good questions. The first answer is to, to, to learn what, what the tzaddik has to say and to, to learn the book, Lukuta Maharan, and to learn the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and to all of the many, many tzaddikim, the wonderful English books. I mean, we live in a generation where it's very difficult to claim that the books are, are, are not available. Everything is revealed. Nothing is revealed, but everything is revealed. Um, right. <laughs> it's funny you say that. <laughs> but... Um, but I, I would say I would start with making a kli is it, or becoming a vessel is is making a hachlata, making a decision to be present in this moment, or to take this activity seriously and to, to draw, to be prepared, to to experience just a little bit more awareness of Hashem in my life in this moment, and that decision as I prepare myself, as I gather up my kochos and I. Whether I say it or I think it unconsciously, I, I am prepared to, to perform this moment, to be present in this moment for Hashem, for the sake of Hashem, for the sake of my soul. That's making a kli. That's making a kli, being prepared for that moment to be filled with meaningful experience and to realize that that, that was a moment of encounter with God. Another way of making a kli is taking upon oneself a particular behavior or, or activity or healthy habit for, for the sake of moving oneself ever so forward and to do it mindfully, not only for the health benefits or the psychological benefits or the spiritual benefits, but also ultimately for the connection that that opportunity and that action offers you. So that's what those are the two ways that I would I would describe becoming a vessel, but both of them are ultimately the same. It's the, It's saying to... To the moment, I am, I am prepared. It's very connected to Torah Vav, the sixth teaching that Ana zamin the, the name of Tshuva, the name that Hashem reveals to Moshe at the burning bush when he says, Eheke, I will be what I will be, is a future-oriented name. It's not quite here yet, but it's still in the process of becoming what it will be. It's not just an empty future that remains out of our grasp. It's a future that is somehow connected to the moment itself. And the Zohar Kadush and Rabbi Nachman brings down that the real understanding of that name is Ana Zamin Lemeheve. I am prepared to be. I am prepared in this moment to experience life on life's terms and to be mechazik myself for another moment of Emuna, to believe in Hashem on life's terms, to see the world as it is and to draw down Hashem into the world as it is, which is Memela sweetening that moment, which is Memela Bittel also. But Rab Gedai, I'd like to hear you about Bittal, because I, I, I could... Uh... I mean, as far as building a clear, de definitely a strong schedule that you can have a, you know, that you could deal with what life's given you. Um, and also being very resilient, learning from failure very quickly. I think this is one of the things, you know, I remember three years ago, firing 90% of my company and restarting. Because the clay was, there was no light in the clay. So I, sometimes you have to break a vessel to create a new one. Knowing when, having the dot to know when you have to start all over sometimes, knowing what you need to change, procedure, perspective, and constantly being able to be very, very flexible to do with, like Brother Joey says, the moment. What does the moment want? There's a time to run, there's a time to return. So knowing what to do at all times is definitely, you know, building a clear. Tomorrow, if you tell me tomorrow, go open up five rehab centers, I, I could tell you, no problem. I have a clear. I've learned from failure. But if you would have told me that five years ago, I would have told you I would have, I would have a massive failure. So learning from learning from things in life, learning what's working, learning what's not working. Um, you know, th th we spoke about today that there's definitely a connection between mercy and dot. If there's no dot, there's no mercy. So there's no mercy. It's it's you can't you can't have mercy if you don't have dot. So to the extent that we build our dot is the extent that we build our okay, the extent that we get the mercy we get. And again, and, have, and that's the ability to just that is to connect to this moment. Connect to that moment to what, what needs to be connected. And again, in the Bittal concept is definitely what I do is, is, is just, I would say, I, I would go 
you know, we spoke about the other day that an emotion, an experience is, a, is a, an emotion is an experience after any event. We have an event, there's an experience, it creates an emotion. Being always recognizing how much I know nothing and constantly getting myself into recognizing that am I looking at this the right way instead of running with my emotions. So then I could, I could accept that I don't know everything. And then I could say, you know what? God created the world out of mercy. So I can also, I don't know. I can go to sleep sometimes crying and wake up feeling great. And that's, that's the surrender, knowing that there's a moment to do everything at, at a particular mm -hmm. time. Right. And, and that surrender, that aspect of, of rachamim rabim, I mean, the Arizal gave a number of reasons for the creation in the world. Amongst them is the revelation of Rachamim, but Rabbi Nachman uses that as the essential reason in numerous places, implying that for Rabbi Nachman, the ultimate purpose of this world is Rachamim, is compassion. And again, Rachamim is not love. Rachamim is something more delicate and, and more vulnerable than love. It's, it's recognizing it's shared humanity and, and, and nullifying myself and making myself ever so smaller for the other, for someone other than me, to realize it's not all about me. And that rachamim, that, that compassion on the other, which is also a compassion on ourselves, enables das. If I'm thinking about myself all the time and I'm self-obsessed, I can't connect to everything because I'm caught up within myself. Correct. But it's only by making room for the other and, and seeing the positive point in the other that I, that I have that das. You're caught up in the, in, the, in the messenger, not the message. Mm -hmm. And that's where growth begins, when you focus on the message, not the messenger. Exactly. And everything we know, everything we see in the world, the Baal Shem Tov has taught us already. Or, I mean, our Nevi'im have taught us, the Torah teaches us, everything that we see in the world is for us. How many times do we have to teach that to patients, uh, Rabbi Joey? How many times do we have to tell it's not about you? At least as much as many times as I need to teach it to myself. Right, but we, I mean, it, it's all day long. It seems to be something happens. We, we take it personal, you know, mm -hmm. we get tra traumatized. Mm -hmm. But hurt people hurt others, and we're victims of victims. So here we go. So unless you start seeing it that way, right. you can never and, get out of yourself. And, and realizing that in, in magia lanu shum davar, we don't have anything coming to us. Right. You know, it's so another, that's another, it's another big concept. That the world is is it a very instant gratification? Mm -hmm. I deserve everything. This is one of the roots of the problems. The, the, because I, I think part of the part of the reason that it's a difficult concept to share is because most of the time when we say the word undeserving, which is not so much a, a very nice word, um, we think it's because of some lack within us. It's a very commonly held belief that I'm not good enough to to receive something so that I see, want. Right. But, but if we realize it's not that we're not good enough, it's that it's we're imperfect. We're, we're bale chisarun, which is, which is a, a constitutive element of what it means to be human being. This is something, an idea I hold very dearly, and I think that it's in all of the tzaddikim, I think it's a foundation, is that being imperfect is not, is not our fault. It's, it's the way we're meant to be. It's, perfection is not a thing. Not a, it's not a concept. The only possibility of perfection is by Hashem. That's it. Right. Beautiful. And we, when we can accept that, so then we're, we're more compassionate on ourselves and others. Less judgmental, mm -hmm. easier to get up. It's, it's really the key. Perfectly imperfect. Yeah, and just trying, just trying. And also, like, what, what other option is there? What other option is there? Ah, uh, uh, you could say that we know that because we've tasted Hungarian wine, but you know, look, Rabbi Nachman went down to the very bottom and he came back saying, "Chever, this is this. It's going to be a scary journey, but this is the path that that I have found to be most beneficial, and and these are the truths about that path. And and lo and behold, they're like the most human and and redemptive concepts imaginable." Geshert Tsarmaot, it's a very narrow bridge. And just don't make yourself afraid. Nobody wants to admit that. Who wants, what spiritual leader, what, what light of spirituality, what Torah wants to admit that this world is a super scary place? This is. Because, but once you accept that very basic fact, so then you could get to work on, on, on being present and right, 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 being right, right. down. Rabbi, I'm going to Hungary. I'll buy. I'll, get, I'll bring you some Hungarian wine. Who are you going to? Which Rav is... Shaila. We're going to Rav Shaila. Uh, Rav Shaila. Shaila. Yeah, I have a I have a deep family connection somehow, but I was there once. I merited to be there. 
It's gorgeous. Never been there. You know, Rav Shaila, the story they say about Rav Shaila is that he used to give out over hot rolls. You heard this, Misa? I heard, I heard, I heard something with the he food fund, yes. Over, he used to go, give over rolls. His whole thing was feeding the Jewish people. Malava Malka, just feeding empty mouths and, and making a Jew feel warm. And, and that's it. That was the only thing. I'm protecting Jewish houses from mice. And mice are not just mice. Mice are the akravim, the, the negative thoughts that the Jewish people have about themselves, about Hashem, about the world. So our tzaddik can protect us from the mice. But, but there was a time where he, he had run out of rolls to give. And he looked at his Rebbe and like he didn't know what to do. And he sensed that, okay, just continue giving out rolls. And he would put his hand in and have another roll, put his hand in and have uh, another roll until, until he needed to stop. Wow, amazing. So Rav Weinberger speaks about that as the need, each person has to go on even when they, they can't go on. When you mamish feel like you can't go on, not that maybe I can't go on, but I can't go on, that's dafka, daika, specifically the time to go on. That's natsachti va'anatseach. I have been victorious over this moment which means that it has ended, but nope, I'm going to be even more victorious because I'm going to reveal that the ending is not really even an ending. There's no ending. Beautiful. It's all infinite. Beautiful. Oriel, the next question? Sure. What is the best way to gain wisdom from a painful experience instead of regretting it or feeling like it was a waste of time? Thank you again for the advanced insight and advice. I think first the person has to be patient enough to, to allow the situation to settle and take place first. And that, that sar and pain and regret are, are all natural human feelings and natural human experiences. And in fact, they're experiences that are no different than joy, except that they're more painful. It's, it's a way of serving Hashem in that moment. And so, I mean, we can learn a lot about this from the halachos of Avelis or the mourning process, that there's different mm -hmm. stages of time. But you, you certainly do not try and, and, and see it in a different lens when you haven't properly processed whatever that experience is. Then afterwards, you, you first off, you daven about it, specifically when you're in pain, because that pain is very strong energy, especially emotional pain, and it has to go somewhere. And, and very often, it's much easier to cry um, over over these painful things in our lives, whatever it is, and to utilize that power to say, okay, I don't care why I'm crying right now, but I'm going to utilize this opportunity to direct my tears to, to God. And that doesn't mean saying words of, of, of tefillah. It means just complaining and saying all the things that are bothering me, but realizing that that's also davening to God. And, and then slowly but surely, you begin to, to look at your life and, and to develop a little bit more gratitude over, to be more honest with oneself about the thing that I had wasn't necessarily so wonderful or the situation that I went through wasn't so terrible. Now, I want to just make an asterisk. I, there are situations that are that terrible, right? There are situations that are so terrible that need a, a different type of approach. But generally speaking, I think it's safe to assume that if a person is privileged, the, the terrible things are not, nothing is unbearable. It's a, it's a hard but ultimate truth. Nothing is unbearable for a human being nothing and to realize that and to look for the positive in it and then eventually to come and realize that you know i'm better off without it sometimes the problem becomes a solution mm. like we spoke about this many times in this rabbi you have many classes in the in the problem the solution is there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the ultimate purpose of distance is, is drawing close which means that distance is also drawing close you're never out of the circle a person is always within the safety and the womb of amuna that's the that's the chiddush. That's the joke of it. No matter where you fall, there you are. That's where Hashem is. Like you've just revealed another aspect of Hashem in a place that you and everyone else thought was impossible. Rav Nachman says in lesson sixty five that if you handle pain well, after how do you know you handle pain well? It's after you deal with that situation, you become a different person. Mm -hmm. you, you you develop a new a new mindset in life, a new chiddush, uh, a new way of looking at life. And that means the pain you served you well and you handled the pain correctly. It's saying yes to life. Saying yes. yes. You know, I, I think we've spoken about Viktor Frankl before, right? Sure, sure. You say or Viktor Frankl. Yeah, but but Viktor Frankl, I have to share a picture with you, but there's a picture of Viktor Frankl wearing tefillin. Wow. Um, the the Lubavitcher Rebbe knew him and he sent someone, there's a whole thing. I heard but, that I, I remember the I heard that story. Beautiful yeah. story. 
But Viktor Frankl, they recently published a, a book of lectures that he gave even before writing Man's Search for Meaning. So this was, oh, in, wow. the, this was wow. in the DP camps, literally. Meaning, and the title of the book, the title of the book, I, I honestly, I haven't read the book. I, I bought it right when it came out, but the title of the book is Saying Yes to Life in Spite of It All. Wow. And that to me, I mean, that's uh, that's wow. Baruch, that's Baruch Sha'amar Vahaya Ha'olam. That's wow. every day waking up and saying, blessed is he who spoke and created the world, that the world is good. Everything is good. A cold beside there. Everything is okay. Real next question? Sure. We'll stop. Can, sure. How can I talk to Hashem and Davin more daily? Connect to Hashem more. That's question. That's one question, and it relates to the other question. Does Gedali rec recommend meditating and doing his bodhidut or just doing his bodhidut by itself? Gedali, I'm going to defer to you on this. I, I personally, before I start, the first thing I do is I go into a very deep breathing. Because the, the breathing usually gets me in a very chilled out mode. Then that, and that's that's a I, I do like a breathing meditation, I would say. And then afterwards, I, I'll start talking to God. But sometimes I'll have the world running after me. Then I'll just I have, there's no time for meditation, just pouring on my heart. It, it, it really depends on the situation, the circumstance that I'm living in. Sometimes in a normal day, I would do the meditation. Um, just to get my thoughts, my gather my thoughts, and then see the direction, tension I want to go. But sometimes the pain is so strong that it's just a talking it out like with no meditation. So you have to you have to really feel the energy that you're dealing with. You know, obviously when I hear you know bad news about my son or, or news that are not it's the best, it's, I'm not going to go meditate and say, "Hmm, it's not the time." It's the time to to say, "God, please help me." So is that, you're not a robot. You're a human being, and, and you're, the main thing is running to God. Whatever, whatever it's thrown at you, run to God. And your question about definitely your question about praying, you need you need to create ratzon. One of the things when I wanted to wake up at midnight, ratzon, it just didn't happen. You you need to want to happen, and that when you develop that desire and you pray for it to happen, you end up you have to pray to pray. And once you develop that desire, you end up getting what you want. End up getting what you want. So I would say desire and, and meditation, usually when things are okay, but when things are chaotic, I'm going straight to straight, straight out of the heart. Okay. I don't, I don't have anything to add on that. <laughs> so there's one question over here that I can't really make out. But this gentleman is asking, how do I quit, quit my job that's one hour away and I could fall asleep on my way back, but that's my only source of Parnassa. And basically this job is like a trap from him. I, I really don't understand what he's saying, but I'm, I'm assuming that he wants to uh, break away from the job that he has and he wants some direction in terms of Bitachon. Well, that's a question. I don't, uh, you know. The person, ha yeah, I don't know. He's got to pray. He's got to, the situation brought him closer to God. The lack is for the sake of him coming to Hashem. That's the yeah. bottom line. Yeah. It's the only reason lack exists. So could I ask a question? So what's real joy? When it comes to joy, how do you define joy? People, you know, define joy by going to shopping. People define joy by having kids. People define joy by... I don't know, becoming a professor in college and, you know, giving lectures. What's real joy? I would start off with saying that I think on a certain level, or at least a certain aspect of joy, the notion of definition is the opposite of it. Right. To define joy is to, to misunderstand joy because ultimately joy is a state of mind and not, not a concept, right. which means on a certain level that joy means something unique to each and every person. But generally speaking, I think that joy, as the Maharal points out, it's a sense of wholeness, at oneness, of, of shlemut. But on the other hand, we know that shlemut is an impossibility, true shlemut, because only Hashem is shalem. So then I think joy means a, a sense of wholeness, even within what you know is, is not whole. And so it's, it's a state of calmness, even though you're still 
even worried on a certain level, but it's a calmness within the worry. If that makes sense, and there's a certain peace of mind. It's a peace of mind. It's a shalva sanefesh. It's a menucha sanefesh. It's the it's calmness. And um, and I think that in terms of the activities, shopping, eating, those things are not. Those are ways of cultivating that. That's the derech that a person is seeking something, whether it's utilitarian and practical. I have to buy an object which is going to serve a purpose for me, which offers me the joy of having something I didn't have, which Rabbi Nachman describes very clearly. And Rabbi Nassim makes a big deal by the second beggar in the tale of the seven beggars, the deaf beggar, who didn't hear anything because all sounds in this world came from, you know, lack. And even the sounds of joy came from the fulfillment of their lack. Mm-hmm. They now have something that they didn't have previously. But they think that, um, I, I think that we have to find ways, walking, talking, healthy activities, shopping, eating, whatever it is, and then to try and just be present in them, to experience them, and to, to not be worried and to not do it begrudgingly or rushed, unless that's where a person's at. And then you have to be joyous with that. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions. Yes. Rabbi, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rabbi. A pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. Such a beautiful, again, I would recommend Rabbi has so many classes, very advanced the classes, and they're really, really amazing. It's Joey Rosenfeld. You can watch stuff on YouTube or the Chef of Podcast. Um, but I strongly recommend, guys. I influence so much with Rabbi addictions and everything. It's just a different perspective completely on everything. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.